Harmonic Gestalt – Sound from Structure The experience of vision is a truly remarkable phenomenon. We simply open our eyes and the world appears right there in full color and in 3D. And if we look around, we can see parts of the world wherever we point our eyes. The world appears as a surrounding spatial structure, complete with a percept of ourselves at the center of that world, looking at it in various directions. When we have visual hallucinations, we don't see them in our head, we see them out in the world amongst the real objects that we perceive. And when we dream, we have experiences of color and pattern and motion very much like our everyday visual experience. There are two aspects to visual experience. There's the color modal uh, experience of color that we perceive on the surface of objects. And then there's the structural experience of the room itself uh, an invisible framework that seems to hold the color of our experience on its exposed surfaces. The um, amodal percept of the world is very often mistaken for the real world uh, itself perceived directly where it lies. In fact, the amodal percept of the structure of the room is every bit as much a product of your visual processing as is the modal color that you experience on those surfaces. Vision is a constructive or generative function as seen here with the Kaniza triangle, where we see a foreground triangle that's occluding apparently three uh, background uh, circles. We actually see uh, an actual brightness edge across this uh, boundary where the white triangle appears a brighter white than the surrounding background. The experience of the Kaniza triangle contains more explicit spatial information than the retinal stimulus on which it is based. This is the principle of perceptual principle of reification, the construction of a richer, more um, uh, complete representation based on an impoverished sensory input. The Kaniza triangle is actually a three-dimensional uh, percept composed of both modal and amodal components. The modal component is seen as an actual brightness edge, whereas the amodal uh, edges are these that appear to be hidden behind the occlusion. We can still see these as complete circles, and we can trace out where we perceive them to be hidden behind the uh, triangle. Here we have Peter Tse's volumetric worm, an even more impressive example of spatial reification. We see an actual curved surface on this illusory surface with surface normals, each pointing in their own specific direction. We see a regular spiral shape here in this volumetric worm, and you see a circular cross section throughout the worm, including the uh, amodal experience of the completion behind, behind the pillar. Here's Peter Tse's sea monster, uh, which is also perceived as a three-dimensional structure. So perceptual reification is the most extraordinary uh, visual function. How the visual system performs this spatial reification remains a deep, dark mystery. But that it does so is an observational fact. If an artist were commissioned to take a two-dimensional image of a street scene and build it into a three-dimensional diorama, painted diorama model, what the artist would be commissioned to do is everyday visual function where we take the two-dimensional retinal stimulus and expand it into a three-dimensional experience. The primary function of the visual system is the generation of a volumetric three-dimensional real-time moving colored image of the world in experience based on the information from sensory input. 
Hallucinations demonstrate the capacity of the brain to, to construct vivid structures of experience. Dreams demonstrate the capacity of the brain to construct whole worlds of spatial experience. So all this raises the question, where is the picture of our experience that we see when we open our eyes. We see it to be outside of ourselves, out in the world directly, and yet the fact that it disappears when you close your eyes suggests that it is causally downstream of the closing of your eyelids. Well, this raises two possibilities. One is direct perception, also known as naive realism, which is the uh, natural intuitive understanding of, world, of the world that we have from the earliest days of childhood, that the world we see around us is the world itself. The problem with this view is that the world seems to go dark when we close our eyes. So the spatial structure that disappears when I close my eyes is distinct from the world of which it is a representation because the world continues to exist even when my eyes are closed. Another alternative is the indirect perception or representationalism whereby the world we see around us is not the real world but a perceptual replica of that world in an internal representation. This would explain why it goes dark when we close our eyes. Um, Others have proposed a projection theory, whereby experience is a spatial structure produced by the brain, but it's projected back out of the brain to appear superimposed on the world. The problem with this theory is that there is no evidence of this projection anywhere out in the world outside a person's head. Finally, there are those who insist that it's possible to have a full colored three-dimensional spatial experience in the absence of any kind of explicit spatial representation in the brain. Well, there's an information theoretic problem with this because the information in experience has an information content and information cannot exist without a medium to carry that information. The causal chain of vision clearly indicates that the place to look for the uh, image of experience is right here in the visual cortex. If the properties of our experience are to be believed, there's a volumetric, uh, there's a volumetric imaging system in our brain that creates volumetric images as rich and complex as what you see around you here. And apparently, it is separated into different cortical areas, and yet they all seem to share the same image, something that is only possible with a resonance representation. The properties of visual experience suggest an explicit image-like representation in our brain. But whether the image of experience is an explicit spatial structure in your brain, or whether that image is projected out of your brain into the world, or whether you can have a spatial experience in the absence of an explicitly spatial neural representation. In any case, whatever the ontology of the image of experience, that image is the essential product or output of the visual system without which vision would be useless. We can circumvent the thorny philosophical issue by modeling perception as an input-output function where the stimulus is a two-dimensional uh, image which is then projected into three-dimensional space where perceptual processes uh, find the uh, most uh, uh, simple interpretation of the stimulus. Here is another example of uh, what looks like a cubical box in a corner. Here's the stimulus as a two-dimensional image. It is uh, projected into the perceptual space where it is fleshed out as a volumetric uh, image. This is the perceptual transformation from 2D to 3D, vision as an input-output function. In the case of Peter Tse's volumetric worm, what the visual system is doing is taking this projection and turning it into that. Now, whoa, look at this thing. That is such a regular, geometrically orderly uh, percept. How does the visual system find that orderly alternative from among all of the infinite uh, alternatives available? We see the pillar complete with an amodal experience of the worm completing behind the pillar. 
there's apparently a simplicity metric in effect here where the visual system picks the simplest explanation for the given uh, stimulus. Uh, based, and the simplicity metric appears to be based on symmetry. This is the Gestalt metric of Pagnantz. But I argue that the symmetry must be detected in full three dimensions because there is no symmetry in the two-dimensional projection. Likewise for Peter T's uh, sea monster. This is the perceptual transformation from this stimulus to a three-dimensional uh, percept, including an amodal percept of the submerged portions of the monster. Again, this symmetry must be de detected in the full three-dimensional context because there is no symmetry to be detected in the two-dimensional projection. What we have here is the inverse optics problem, a problem that's well known. Forward optics is just regular optical projection whereby images in the world project through the lens onto the retina. Now these four quadrilaterals, since they all happen to share the same four rays at their corners, they all project to the same rectangle on the retina. The entire third dimension of depth is collapsed into just a two-dimensional projection. The inverse projection is an attempt to reverse this projection and to calculate from this two-dimensional retinal stimulus all the possible three-dimensional quadrilaterals that may have projected to it. Uh, now this inverse projection is uh, mathematically under constrained because there are an infinite, I only drew four of them here, but there are an infinite number of quadrilaterals uh, of all kinds of irregular uh, shapes. And uh, also an even larger number of uh, disconnected line segments that all project to the single rectangle. So this is a problem that is practically impossible to compute. So how on earth does the visual system resolve the inverse optics problem? Gestalt theory is a holistic field-like principle of computation that defies explanation in conventional computational terms. Gestalt theory offers clues to the nature of the simplicity metric pregnance uh, with a suggestion that the, um, uh, all of the different interpretations are reified simultaneously and then the most simple configuration is picked out by pregnance. So here, by pregnance, we can see that this must be a simpler explanation than that, uh, and it is indeed information theoretic wise. This one carries less information because uh, that one requires the chance alignment of three uh, random figures, whereas this just requires a triangle and three circles, a more regular interpretation. Pagnance has a natural hierarchy. The square is more regular than the rhombus, more regular than the parallelogram, uh, more regular than the trapezoid, and so forth. Uh, and this really seems to indicate that Pagnance is a function of the information content of the shape. The more irregular the shape becomes, the more information is uh, required to encode it. So the tendency towards Pagnance can be seen as the perceptual equivalent of Occam's razor. Now there appears to be a kind of inverse projection going on from um, image space into uh, perceptual space. And uh, processes within this representation pick out and highlight the simplest interpretation of the stimulus, which in this case is the triangle in front of three circles because apparently it is more pregnant than the alternative. Now, pregnant has been criticized as being a heuristic metric. You know it when you see it, but it's hard to quantify. Well, information theoretic uh, terms have quantified it to some extent, but Hochburg and Brooks, 1960, were the first to provide a quantitative metric for pregnance. They devised a number of uh, figures such as this and asked subjects who viewed them to report whether they see them as 2D images, as this one is likely to be seen, or do they see them in depth as three dimensions, as this one is likely to be perceived. 
and they formulated the, the, the data um, that sorted these images in this kind of sequence where this is most likely to be 2D, this is most likely to be perceived as 3D, and these are intermediate uh, cases. They then found that if you count the number of sides of all the same length, and you count all of the angles in the figure that are of the same angular size, then uh, do this same calculation for both the three-dimensional percept and the corresponding two-dimensional interpretation. And whichever one produces the simpler metric is the one that tends to be perceived. Now, this is an interesting problem because it exemplifies the computational challenge inherent in the problem. In particular, human observers are required in order to see the three-dimensional percept. Now, can we automate the process of spatial perception? This is a profound challenge that requires an unconventional approach. Here's the combinatorial problem. Seeing this image here, for example, as a two-dimensional stimulus as it's printed on this page, here is that page, and if we view it obliquely, Here's that two-dimensional uh, page with the three-dimensional figure on it. Then we take that depth dimension and slowly expand it into depth until we have explored the full range from depth equals zero to depth equals, I don't know, infinity. And for each one, we calculate a three-dimensional spatial uh, matrix uh, that measures the regularity of the cube and whichever one is the most regular, whether it's the two-dimensional or the three-dimensional or anyone in between, that is the one that becomes the uh, final person. So it's a combinatorial problem because you have to compute an infinite range of depths. Now, I propose a harmonic solution whereby the comparison of line lengths is done by um, harmonic resonance. So in the perceptual space, a line represented at a certain length will resonate at the frequency corresponding to that length. And so, for example, in the case of the two-dimensional perceptual interpretation of uh, this uh, stimulus, each of these lines would be perceived to be of different lengths. The vertical is slightly longer than the diagonal, and this line, long line, is broken into uh, two pieces by this intersection. And so, the yellow ones would resonate with the yellow ones and the blue ones with the blue ones and so forth. Now, in the case of the 3D perceptual experience, all of these sides are now interpreted to be the same length and all these angles are 90 degrees and therefore this is the simplest interpretation. That's why we tend to perceive it in three dimensions. So I propose a simple model where we have a linear resonance that emerges whenever there are two endpoints of uh, a line in perceptual space. So for example, these lines in perceptual space are all the same length, therefore they would all sing the same uh, sound or tone, and therefore they would reinforce each other by uh, resonance by being all the same uh, sound. Here's my harmonic gestalt program written in Python. It presents a stimulus screen where we put two dots and it makes a musical tone. We see in the Fourier space we see the peak on either side of the origin and we see how the frequency increases as the distance uh, changes. Now we're going to add another point over here and now we hear another tone at a much higher frequency. This one here is due to this short distance here whereas these two longer distances are about the same. Now, as we move this dot slowly right to left, we see the changes in the peaks here. And as we approach an isosceles configuration, we see a little more regularity in the spectrum. It uh, simplifies to just two peaks, one for these shorter distances and one for that longer distance. There we go. That's the symmetry of the isosceles. Now we're going to increase this, move this dot up and watch the harmonic trace. And we'll see that as we approach the equilateral configuration, the tone becomes even more harmonious. We can turn up the volume a little bit here. 
see how the peak gets really sharp when you find just the right distance. So there's the harmonious sound generated by an equilateral triangle. It's rotation invariant because if we change the orientation, it does not change the sound at all. It's an intrinsic metric. And to some extent, it's also invariant to scale because although uh, reducing the scale does increase the um, frequency, it preserves the harmony, the fact that there's only one uh, peak uh, and therefore the simplicity metric is preserved through scale. So we have a system here that can represent uh, shapes like triangles in a translation invariant manner. It makes the same sound wherever the triangle is loca located. It's rotation invariant as well, and to some extent it's scale invariant. This is because the triangle is represented by an intrinsic metric that depends only on the relative lengths of its sides, something that does not depend on location or orientation. Pregnance suggests a certain hierarchy. For example, the square is simpler than the rhombus, which is simpler than the parallelogram, which is simpler than the trapezoid, and so forth. We said before that pregnance is a function of the information content of the shape. So the more irregular the shape is, the more information is required to store it. So now pregnance in a harmonic resonance model can be seen as a function of the energy required to sustain that resonance because anything higher than the third or fourth or fifth harmonic requires too much energy uh, to sustain it. So the tendency towards pregnance can be seen as the loss of higher harmonics due to low-pass filtering effects. Here's my harm, harmonic gestalt 3D program. Again, it presents a stimulus screen. This time there's already one dot. But this time it also shows perceptual space as an inverse projection from the 2D stimulus image into the depth dimension. So this line here can be considered a uh, probability density function of the probable location of this dot in depth. In this program, I provide a slider where we can adjust the depth of that point um, at will. Now, if we add a second point, now we have two points. isosceles symmetry to it. But if we now adjust the depth of just that third point, we can move it deeper into depth. until we find the point of perfect harmony. Kind of right to get that. There we go. So what this is, is an equilateral triangle in depth with a harmony between its components over here. And that explains how this isosceles triangle tends to be perceived as an equilateral triangle in depth. So what we have here is a system that can encode simple shapes like this triangle in a rotation, translation, and to some degree scale invariant manner in a full 3D representation. The uh, shape of the triangle is encoded by the ratio of the sides, uh, side lengths, and this is an intrinsic metric uh, that uh, is independent of the rotation translation of the shape. Uh, and now we can do full 3D shapes as well, 
uh, in the nature of a Clifford algebra multivector with the intrinsic metric to um, represent the sh shape. So what we have is a 3D volume of point oscillators where emergent oscillations tend to e emerge between adjacent points in the matrix. And the global oscillation of the whole shape tends to resonate, especially with symmetry and closure to promote the resonance. Uh, all this as constrained by the input stimulus, so these dots can slide in depth until the configuration is the most regular. Now we've uh, simulated the forward problem here, that um, we give it the depths of three points and it determines the tone. But vision has to solve the inverse problem, which is a far more formidable problem. Given these three uh, inputs in the stimulus, what is the most reasonable percept, this requires a reification of every possible configuration of the inverse projection of these lines into space. And then from that inverse projection, somehow some kind of process will pick out first this and then maybe that uh, as the most uh, uh, simple interpretation. Now, this is an impossible computation. It simply cannot be done because there's too many alternatives to be tested unless this is implemented in a parallel analog wave-based mechanism where all the possibilities are reified simultaneously in parallel. So if the fact that the visual system solves the inverse optics problem involuntarily, effortlessly, and instantaneously is direct evidence for harmonic uh, resonance representation in vision because no other computational principle is able to reify an infinite range of possibilities simultaneously and in parallel. So, for example, we see some of this in uh, harmonic resonance in a simple tube. If you blow in the tube, the tube will resonate at its multiple harmonics. Here we show the first six harmonics. The first harmonic is this yellow one. Second harmonic is the blue that has a node in the middle. Third harmonic is the orange one and so forth. So this tube already has a natural tendency to try to find all the possible patterns that are possible within this length of tube. Now, if we open a hole in the middle of this tube, this creates a damping effect because the um, air can no longer oscillate at this point. This is like a short circuit where the um, uh, energy escapes out through the hole and thus it creates a node at this point. And what that node does is it kills all of the harmonics that had an antinode at this position because it damps them out of existence, leaving only the harmonics that all have a node uh, at this midpoint. Now, likewise, if we open a second hole at a quarter of the way along, then this second hole will then damp uh, all um, patterns that have an antinode at this location, and that turns out, in this case, to be this fourth harmonic, so only the fourth harmonic uh, will uh, survive. Here we have two-dimensional Cladney figures that do essentially the same thing. When you bow them with a violin bow, they resonate at a, a standing wave frequency that um, uh, when you sprinkle salt on the plate, it gathers along the nodes of oscillation. And you can get lo lots of different nodes, patterns, from a single steel plate. Note how this fellow is damping the plate at the corner, and that stimulates the emergence of a node along that corner. So here are all of, or many of the possible patterns that can appear on a square plate. And if you were to touch this uh, corner right here, uh, that promotes a node at that point, and all of a sudden, the, uh, the plate now can only uh, resonate at a subset of the patterns, the ones marked here in yellow, because all of them share a damping at the top left corner. If, in addition, we, for example, damped the top center side, 
Now we have a node in the top left and the top center, and now in red here we see only those patterns that have both uh, nodes at both of the top left and the uh, top center. So what we have is a system here. It's uh, um, uh, So what we have is a hierarchical representation of shape with an automatic mechanism to complete the whole shape given whatever inputs uh, are uh, available. Now there's two kinds of oscillations that we can use on a um, clad knee plate. For example, we could use a gear wheel rotating to drive the uh, oscillations on the plate and it will force the oscillations to go to occur at a frequency determined by the gear wheel. But there's a whole different kind of um, energizing of resonance using a violin bow. A violin bow is uh, the, it's sticky with rosin. So as you bow it, the plate uh, sticks for a split second and then twangs back and then sticks and then twangs back. But the important principle here is that as the uh, plate bends down, here's a downward bend because the bow is moving downwards, that bending signal travels to the other side of the plate and reflects back again, and that wave triggers the next release of the uh, bow on the plate. So what you get is a uh, resonance that is determined by the intrinsic resonance of the plate. It's not driven or forced by the uh, by, by something like the gear wheel. So we see this also here in um, uh, instruments uh, like the trumpet. Here's a trumpet. The trumpeter's lips are over here, and whenever the lips pop, they send a pulse of air that goes to the far end of the tube, and there it reflects back again. And when it hits the lips, it triggers them to send another pulse. So it's the pulse of wave coming back from the far end of the trumpet that triggers the uh, the um, next pulse. Here's a clad knee plate, a steel plate being bowed with a violin bow. You see how he is touching the plate with his thumb at one point, and that promotes the emergence of a node at that point. Now he's touching at two points, and he's trying to bring another point in between that's a higher harmonic of that point. Here's another pattern obtained. And here we have the square plate. Notice that because of the bowing, it's not forcing one pattern, but it's filling out all of the natural resonances that are inherent in the plate. Mary Waller perfected the Kladni plate idea by using a piece of dry ice held in tweezers and pressed against the plate to generate these different uh, patterns. Um, she discovered these patterns in uh, the triangular plates at various orientations, and here are more uh, square plate uh, patterns. Mary Waller made the significant observation that these resonances are obviously ornamental in nature. And the reason why is that human uh, culture has always favored ornamental patterns that are uh, endowed with symmetry and periodicity because of the resonances in our own brain. The fact that we can pick out and perceive all of these symmetries and regularities instantaneously uh, without having to think about it shows that this is a rather low-level uh, process. The kaleidoscope demonstrates an extraordinary capacity for picking out pattern because what you're seeing is a global emergent pattern from millions of little detailed stimuli, and yet it's the global nature of the pattern that makes it um, perceivable. So now, where are all these waves in the brain? What's the neurophysiology behind all of this? Well, first of all, 
Uh, it's a well-known fact that if you do intracell recording with uh, intracellular electrodes, you can also do extracellular recording with uh, electrodes just outside the cell. And the reason is that uh, uh, when you get a positive pulse inside the cell, right outside the cell, there's a symmetrical negative pulse uh, because the cell wall does not insulate against uh, pulses. You see, the cell wall operates like a dielectric in a capacitor, an insulating layer that prevents um, direct current from flowing across the plate. However, the dielectric does transfer the voltage across the plate such that the capacitor uh, can block DC current, but it does not block AC current. Now, if this is also true of the cell wall, then, then it obviously is true, then the idea that we've had of a neuron all along as a kind of like a wire containing a voltage which is then communicated through synapses to uh, other neurons is actually mistaken. And what we should really consider is neurons as an antenna that when the neuron pulses, it sends out electrical waves in all directions through the intercellular uh, medium, and that this antenna function of the neuron is what is uh, most significant. So what can you do with waves? Well, for one thing, you can build 3D volumetric moving pictures with them. Here is Paul Falstad's box modes applet that simulates the acoustical resonance inside a square box. We can rotate it to an angle here to see it in depth. Here it's showing an oscillation in the X dimension. So this is X over here. Uh, this is a Fourier type representation of the harmonics of this box. That's the first harmonic, that's the second harmonic, that's the third harmonic in X. And likewise, these are the harmonics in Y. You can create more complex patterns with combinations of harmonics. For instance, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh harmonics in X produce this curious back and forth oscillation of a positive plane in the negative field. That's an extraordinarily sophisticated pattern for just a combination of harmonics. We can do the same thing, clear, in the Y dimension. Y, one, two, three, four, and you see as we add the higher harmonics, we get higher resolution of a horizontal plane moving up and down in oscillation. Now, for a three-dimensional version of that, let's do this. We'll turn on mode 111, 222, 333, 444, 555, 666, and 777. And we get this very curious dynamic going on over here. Let's slow it down so we can see what's happening. Flash. Flash. It flashes between two tetrahedrons. Stop. This is one tetrahedron. You could say it's between, let's say, uh, the X, Y, and Z axes. And if we continue, it inverts, <clears throat> turns itself inside out, and becomes a tetrahedron on the other three axes, X, Y, Y, Z, and Z, X. So this is an oscillation between two tetrahedrons in three dimensions in XYZ axes, an extraordinarily sophisticated spatio-temporal con concept represented by just a few harmonics in a wave-like representation. So we see here 
uh, here we have one node that activates this pattern over here. Uh, we can see the harmonic nodes as feature detectors uh, neurons that whenever this pattern is active in the box, this neuron becomes active. And likewise, reciprocally, when this neuron is active, it generates its pattern in the box. So it is automatically bottom-up and top-down, as one would expect in a fully gestalt system. And the meaning of each node is not defined by some kind of programmer. It is defined by the pattern that it can both recognize and reify. The meaning is built in to the nodes by the patterns that they're able to represent. This is a hierarchical system of features in a sinusoidal basis set, much like a Fourier representation. Here we have the harmonics in X, and here we have the harmonics in Y, and here we have various combinations of different harmonics. Whatever wave pattern you put in the box, it automatically decomposes it into its harmonic component. And when you play the harmonic components together with each other, it automatically reifies the combined uh, pattern between them. Now, you can understand the operation of this with a physical analog. Here's a wooden box, like a speaker box, that has three loudspeakers installed at right angles inside the box, and the loudspeakers are connected to oscillators in X, Y, and Z. So if you turn on this oscillator and scan through different frequencies, you'll get different modes of uh, X uh, in the box, and thus you can tune these knobs to get any of the patterns that I've uh, shown. But these are forced oscillations where you're the, the, the uh, signal generator is forcing a signal into the box. This is analogous to forcing the oscillations on a cloud D plate using a rotating uh, gear that forces them at the frequency of the spinning of the gear. Um, another way to find the harmonics of the box is to just blow air over a nozzle at the top of the box and have it uh, resonating like a, like a carboy. If you then play the airstream at different intensities in different directions, you will get a set of harmonics that are the natural harmonics of that bottle. And now you can tune some organ pipes to match to those harmonics. So when you play an organ pipe, its corresponding wave will appear in the cavity. And when a wave is present in the cavity, its corresponding organ pipe will be vibrating. So the oscillations in the brain are not just one-dimensional time traces. They are samples of a spatial standing wave that exists as a dynamic spatial structure. The waves are a physical manifestation of the information content of our mind corresponding to experience. The unity of conscious experience across different cortical areas is explained by a dynamic coupling between standing waves in different areas. Only a harmonic resonance model can account for the unity of experience despite the distributed architecture of the cortex. It's perhaps time for philosophy to inform neuroscience instead of the other way around, because we know there are pictures in the brain. I can see them. The challenge for neurosciences is to find those same pictures in the brain.